So far, we've been looking at muscle in isolation. We've examined the force length property of muscle, the force velocity of property of muscle, and we're analyzing muscle as if it, it's just a muscle living in isolation. But the truth is, muscles attach to the skeleton, and those attachments and the geometry of the skeleton have a big influence on how muscles operate. So in the next set of lectures, we're going to talk about musculoskeletal geometry, the, the geometry of how we're built. It has profound implications for biomechanics of movement, and we'll explore that in the next few lectures. The basic plan is this. We'll talk about musculoskeletal geometry, why we study geometry. We'll define a moment and a moment arm. Those are key parameters for characterizing musculoskeletal geometry. We'll do an example in two dimensions, an example in three dimensions. We'll talk about how to measure moment arms and some example applications. We'll then go to talk about how forces and moments work together to produce joint moments. And finally, some advanced topics on modeling of musculoskeletal geometry. So let's just start with a little bit of motivation. So why study musculoskeletal geometry? One reason is that to just answer fundamental questions. Why are we built the way we are? We are built such that we have muscles that generate very large forces and act at very small distances. So the moment arms, the lever arms of our muscles are quite small. What if instead we were built differently in a way that we had large moment arms? We could generate very large torques or moments about the joints with very little muscle forces. So we'd look kind of funny because we'd be webbed and have muscles crossing distant from the joints, but we're not. We're built with very small moment arms. So why is that? What's the advantage? We'll see that. Why else might we study musculoskeletal geometry? The, another reason is to answer clinical questions. How is muscle function offered, uh, altered by a bone deformity? What I'm showing here is a computer simulation of a, a normal lower limb and one that's altered such that there's a tibial torsion deformity. This occurs frequently in neuromuscular diseases, in uh, cerebral palsy, for example the forces that act on the skeleton are abnormal, and that ends up twisting the bone as the child develops, so you end up with bone deformities. Well, how do these changes in geometry affect muscle function? For that, we need to know. Also, designing surgical procedures. Surgical procedures change geometry. That's exactly what the surgery does, and we'll see how that influences the action of muscles. So they're really fundamental questions and clinical questions practical questions that drive our study of musculoskeletal geometry. So how does this fit in to our overall study of biomechanics of movement? We saw that we move by neural commands that are initiated in the nervous system. We focused on modeling muscle tendon dynamics. Now we're moving to uh, musculoskeletal geometry, and moment arms are the basic measure of geometry of the musculoskeletal system. So we've analyzed muscles in isolation. Muscle moment arms transform muscle forces into joint moments, and that's where we are in the context of class. So with that introduction, we will uh, get started on some of the details.